And second of all, ironically enough, for the sort of common wisdom of communism doesn't work, um, everybody, no matter what their philosophy, sort of acts like communists when working on common projects, especially if there's an emergency, um, because it's efficient. I mean, the example I always give is like, you know, if two people are working, whether they're working for a bank or an oil company or any other capitalist firm, and um, they're trying to clean something up, and one person says, hand me the mop, the other person does not say, yeah, what do I get for it? <laughs> you actually allocate resources according to their abilities and needs because it's efficient. Um, during um, emergencies and disasters, often you know, that, that sort of communistic relation is sort of happens quickly because hierarchy and exchange and, and so forth are, are complexities and luxuries you can't afford. Um, there's a certain degree of similarly baseline efficiency of situations where you need to cooperate. Um, thus, you know, as an initial formulation, it occurred to me that you could say that um, you know, almost all capitalist firms operate mo internally mostly according to a principle of communism. It could sometimes be more hierarchical and sometimes more egalitarian hierarchies I mean, of communism. Um, often the more you have to improvise, the more egalitarian the forms of communism tend to be. Um, the most famous example of, there's actually a Marxist historian talks about this, uh, is the, the Apple computer was a famous example of this. They're all people who dropped out of larger, more vertically organized companies and form these little communistic circles where they would all sit around and get stoned and sort of brainstorm and, and to agree, have a vote on how to dispatch tasks in egalitarian fashion. Because, you know, when you're just completely innovating things, um, hierarchies get in the way. Um, now, but the phenomenon of baseline communism has struck me as even more interesting because I mean, basically the idea is this. If you have sociality, well, the sense of being part of the same society or community has to be founded on a minimal level that if the need is great enough or the cost is small enough, any normal person will ex be expected to act along that principle of from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. Obvious example, the need being great enough would be somebody's drowning. Um, the house is on fire. Everybody will pitch in. Um, if the need is obviously great, um, but also if the cost is small enough, like, you know, do you have a light? <laughs> do you know the way to the bridge? Um, so forth and so on. I mean, there are cases where people will not tell you the right directions, obviously, but it's almost always uh, has to be situations where there's just no sense of commonality whatsoever. Um, and the interesting thing is that the level of this um, varies from society to so society and, and from context to context to so what you can just assume that any person will give you if you ask, where, where it's almost impossible not to, really. Um, there's a famous Maori story about this that I always like to quote. Uh, this guy, Kei Renga, he was a famous for bugging fishermen. Uh, he, because in many societies, a request for food simply, there's just no way to say no, basically, if somebody asks you. Um, so, in this case, he was famous for going up and down the shore whenever somebody came back from a fishing expedition. He would be like, wow, squid, I love squid. And then you have to give him the squid or, you know, whatever it is you caught. He'd, he'd praise the best thing and you have to give it to him. And um, after about five years, people got so annoyed, they formed a little war party and killed him. But it's actually easier just to, like, you know, smack somebody over the head and kill them than to say, no, I'm not going to give you the squid this time. Go fishing yourself. <laughs> Um, so, which tells you something. Um, in a larger sense, I've actually expanded this idea to say that there's like at least three basic principles of, of transactional moral logic that can be said to occur everywhere and the question is how they mix together. One is this communistic principle, which you know you extend more to certain people than to others. It's always the baseline for all human activity and on which everything else is built. Um, then you have exchange, which can either be exchange of gifts or exchange of commodities, which is based on temporary transactions. The interesting thing about communist relations, another element I think that should be emphasized, um, is that they tend to occur where you assume relations will last forever. Exchange is inherently temporary. You know, it can be evened out and then you have no further relation with a person. So that in a relation of exchange, if there is an ongoing relation, it's a relation of debt. So the transaction is not complete. People have not been restored to equality. So, so actual social relations are assumed to be unequal. One party is at fault. 
according to most world religions, uh, both parties are at fault. Um, there's lots of sin and guilt going on. And um, once it's restored, we're equal, but there's no social relation anymore. So it's, it's complicated in that way. Um, whereas hierarchical relations, which I think fall into a completely di different category, operate under totally different logic. <coughs> hierarchical relations, whereas recipro reciprocal relations are based on the assumption, you know, I give you something, you give me something back. Uh, hierarchical relations are based on the principle of I give you something that stands as a precedent for what's expected in the future, so I'm expected to give it again. Um, which was very explicit in a lot of explicitly hierarchical situations. For example, in the Middle Ages, if you give a gift to a hierarchical superior, you need to get them to sign a document. I think it was called a writ of non-prejudice, um, declaring that you don't owe it to them next year just because you gave it to them now. Um, so it's completely the opposite of what we expect the way gifts are supposed to work. Um, now, the interesting thing is how all these things are integrated. And I think a lot of work remains to be done and can be done. One of, for example, one fascinating phenomena that I think hasn't really been looked at is intercultural contact. As, uh, when you have sort of first contact, it becomes really blatant. Um, if you look at Columbus's uh, logs, you know, he's great because he's so clueless. He really doesn't understand what's going on. Um, and you have this sense that he's experiencing these people. Well, when you see these people who might as well be space aliens, you have no idea who they are. There seems to be like three reactions you can do. You can run away. You can try to kill them, um, which is another version of the same thing. Just no contact. Or you, if you do make contact, you sort of give them everything and expect them to do the same. So in order to establish that level of sociality, where that communistic baseline you know, on which other things like exchange and hierarchy can be built, um, you need to sort of start a process of swapping. Um, uh, swapping, on what most called the total prestation, actually. Um, swapping everything, or making clear that you will give everything and you expect them to behave in the same fashion. Um, so it's not actually an exchange. So people, so you know, Columbus's laws are full of this. He says, these guys are great. They're like the best people who ever lived. You know, they came, they give us their pigs. They like suggest we sleep with their sisters. They, um, they, 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 they're, they're just, you know, wonderful. Like, you know, um, whatever we ask for, they give us immediately. Um, they're so nice. And then like, you know, two days later, these are the worst people ever lived. They're all a bunch of thieves. <laughs> they come on the ship and they start taking away the nails. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and it's just like can't put two and two together, right? Um, and yeah, um, so so I think that it's it's really useful to start reconsidering what's already going on. Um, my conclusion from this is that perhaps the best formulation we can make about capitalism is not that it's a principle inimical to communism at all, um, since all other fo all forms of uh, interaction are sort of founded on a base of some sort of communism, but that you know, capitalism might be considered a one way of organizing communism. I personally think a rather bad way of organizing communism. And the question is not like how can we get to something like communism, the capital C in this epic sense, but what would be a better way of organizing communism than capitalism is now?